Hey guys, I'm Naya and welcome back to the channel. So today I'm joined by a multiple time YCS winner, a world competitor, a YouTuber, a streamer, and a very important name overall in our community, none other than Joshua Schmidt. Welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to have you here today. So what we're going to be talking about is something that I think a lot of people are going to want to hear it from you. We're going to talk about how to prepare for a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament. We're going to talk about the thought process behind choosing a deck, the mentality when you're actually there, your top cut mentality, a lot of a lot of things. So yeah, I'm very excited to get started. But first, maybe I would like to hear a couple words about your roots in Yu-Gi-Oh, about your history, how you got started and how you really got into the competitive side of things. Okay, that's a potentially a very long story, but I'm trying to make it short. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, I've been I've been playing since I think the very beginning. Not like tournaments, because back then when Yu-Gi-Oh came out, I was like I don't know six, seven, eight years old. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started like literally in uh, primary school, uh, and I think I went to my first tournament when I was around like eleven years old in like two thousand and six. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was 2005, I don't remember, uh, it, but it was, it was very long ago. And uh, I don't know, I've never, I've never really stopped playing. I've always been playing and uh, entered my first bigger tournaments once I discovered, you know, what locals were mm -hmm. and then gone up from there. And like my, I've played the, my first YCS, which was the first European YCS ever was YCS Bochum in, I think it was 2011 uh, and... Yeah, and then like in, in 2012 was when I got to top four at the European Championship. More on like, more, more by accident, honestly. By like accident. I wasn't bad, but I was, <laughs> also wasn't like it, great yet. You know, it's just like more like I had a very, very good and lucky run. All right. And uh, that meant, you know, qualifying for Worlds, which was kind of crazy because I was 16 years old. And then like that just kind of like completely sucked me into the game. Like I was just like... After that, I was completely hooked, you know, I never stopped. And ever since then, I've also mm. not missed a single European YCS, so. Well, that's yeah. an impressive thing. <laughs> so that's really cool. I mean, I think you are most definitely the right person to talk to <laughs> when it comes to our topic today. Um, so I think it's important to talk about, right? Because a lot of people, like, sometimes they don't really know how to approach it, right? When it comes to mm -hmm. choosing a deck specifically, it's what I wanted to talk about first, because I remember in the last format, you were really big on how Sprite is really important because it can counter tier quite well if you're choosing the correct tech cards and all of that. So first I wanted to talk about maybe how when you're choosing a deck, it's important to choose between either a top strategy or a way to counter the top strategy, mm -hmm. like completely, like something like Flunder used to be or even Exorcister yeah. to an extent. Uh, and then the third, part of it is maybe choosing a strategy that can counter the top strategies but still play on its own like right now when we're moving to a bit of a more diverse format so what's your thoughts like how would you recap like how to choose a deck specifically uh it's i i always look for something that is very consistent but also very strong which is easier said than done but mm -hmm. like there's a lot of decks that are very, very strong. Like you mentioned Fluon de Ries, which is a deck that if it has a good hand is a very strong and very hard to counter deck. Right. But it, it usually struggles a little bit with, with consistency. Mm -hmm. And that is usually because these types of decks are relatively streamlined in their lines of play. Like they will always pretty much try to do the same thing every time. Mm -hmm. And um, that is something that leaves the player with very little agency in what they want to do. Because every single hand, you just look at like, oh, do I have this certain combo that my deck does or do I not have mm -hmm. it? Uh, a current example now that Fluanderies is like very, very like unpopular, it would mm -hmm. probably be something like Mathmec, where Mathmec is, is a strong deck if it gets right. to play, but it always does the same thing. So if you don't have that thing or that thing doesn't work in this specific instant because of X or Y card your opponent has, mm -hmm. then... You can be as as good of a player as you want. You you can't win with Mathmec if you don't have Circular, or if your if your opponent prevents Circular, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so I I tend to try and pick decks that leave me with some sort of flexibility. You know, like the the in 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 the recent months we've had decks like Tierlament or Sprite, which right. they had streamlined combos to an extent. But depending on what your hand was or what your opponent did, they could play very differently in like very different scenarios. And I personally think that's very valuable not only because i think it's more fun that way if you're mm -hmm. not doing the same thing every time but also because it's like actually an advantage in terms of 
playing the actual game, it's 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 very good to have different options available because different mm -hmm. options, first of all, it means it's harder to play, which is why I think some people pick other decks, but yes, um, it, true, it yeah. also means, <laughs> yeah. But like having other options available means you can make you can make bad choices, but you can also make very good choices. And, I, sure. and that's a very good thing if you are capable of making good choices. Um, but generally, in terms of countering the metagame, I think that is something that is very, very relevant in formats that don't have like 10 different decks. You know, mm -hmm. like one example of that would be, I don't know how many will remember, but Zodiac format was something where... <laughs> Everyone was playing Zodiac, right. and and Paleozoic just happened to beat Zodiac, even though Paleozoic in itself was was not like a tier zero super oppressive deck. Because mm -hmm. if everyone wanted to counter Paleo, they probably could have, but it just happened to beat Zodiac. So mm -hmm. uh, if you were able to make that right meta call to to bring Paleozoic frogs to a to a YCS, uh, then you could you could have great success. Another example would maybe be. This last year's European Championship, literally everyone yeah. was playing the one out to to Mystic Mine, right? And I did the 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 beat cop Mystic Mine yes. kind of thing. Yes, and then Twitter blew up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but like things like that, I think is why I personally usually enjoy meta games more where there's not that many decks, mm -hmm. um, because then you can really make decisions like that in deck building. Right. Diverse formats have their own set of skills that you need, but they are different. Like mm -hmm. if you're if you're preparing for five, six, seven decks, I would recommend not doing something like that, where you are building a deck to specifically counter one or two decks when there's like six, seven different uh, decks course. you might reasonably face throughout Swiss. Then there's no point in in encountering Kaish Tira when like you're playing a lot of other decks too in the main deck. So in those mm -hmm. in those types of formats, I, li I like to look into decks that have like solid matchups across the board. You know, I don't need to, I don't need to hard counter Cash Tira and then sacrifice other matchups. I'm looking for something that has like solid matchups across the board, which can sometimes be very hard, mm -hmm. which is why from a competitive standpoint, very often super diverse formats are very, very hard to prepare for because Yes. You just don't know exactly what you're going to face. You know? It's also not a lot of players' preference due to the fact that it's hard to prepare for. Like, it's 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 kind of... It feels kind of sad when you're maybe testing or preparing for something and then you go up against two or three strategies that you didn't really expect and you there was no way of preventing it. So so I get why some people aren't exactly fans of, of those kinds of formats. What would be a deck right now that you maybe, even if you're, you personally aren't maybe gravitating towards it, what would be a deck that you would recommend to people that really has it, like that has the consistency, that has the matchups, like right now, for example? Mm, as much as I personally don't love it because mm -hmm. of what I said earlier with like the deck is very streamlined and right. usually tries to do the same thing but Cash Tira is a deck that mm -hmm. if the format is very diverse and you really have no idea what you want to play I think Cash Tira is something that you can't really go super wrong with I mean mm -hmm. it is something that most people expect right now most people will be sure. prepared for it so it's not like the end all be all solution and it is uh, while it does have some different lines of plays overall it is relatively streamlined so it's not going to be like you know the I, I don't think it's like the holy grail of the current format but right. it is relatively consistent and it it has like it can only have that bad of a matchup you know like it, it can't be that bad because your 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 one two card combos are just very solid mm -hmm. um of course the deck is very expensive another deck that i think is also solid into a lot of decks is is labyrinth right now but okay. the thing is labyrinth has also recently picked up in popularity so mm -hmm. and it is a, a heavy back row deck so it loses to card like people are starting to actually respect it and play cards like you know i've seen denko seka mm -hmm. you see a lot of evenly matched you see a yeah. lot of like i mean feather duster is always there mm -hmm. so it's it's tough to make the call on bringing labyrinth but I personally am still considering it for the next YCS because I, I really enjoy the fact that it's a trap deck, but it's not one of those like super, super floodgate based. They do play skill drain usually, but for the most part, it's a deck True. that can win yeah. just with like out grinding people. Like it kind of reminds me of of like a 2023 version of Paleozoics, which why, is why <laughs> I kind of enjoy it. But um, that deck is also solid simply because it plays so differently from all the other decks, right? Mm -hmm. back, row, back row approach is not something that any of the current top decks do, except Labyrinth. So in the main deck, most people are not going to be prepared for it. You know, there's like a couple mm -hmm. main deck evenlies here and there, but for the most part, people are not um, prepared for, for that type of uh, deck. 
I mean, it's exciting to see because the last time we had this was like Outledge when it came out and then the Synchro Outledge and the Zoo Outledge and all that. And then mm -hmm. Chabdex sort of just died for a period. And no one really no one really got excited about Chabdex anymore. So I think it's great. I think Labyrinth is a very, very decent choice right now. Like, especially because like you mentioned, there aren't a lot of floodgates that the deck is, play it, uh, that the deck is playing. So it's not that hated <laughs> by, by no. people, I think. So that's really nice to see also. I mean, there's a Trap Tricks hype, of course, as well. Yep. Like. We shouldn't mm -hmm. forget the Chap Tricks hype, but I don't think it's a bad deck at all. I think Chap Tricks is really solid as well. Um, yeah. I don't know, maybe after some time when a lot of people are going to play, especially because it's budget and then everyone's going to know how to counter it, then it might not be as great uh, because there was a lot of the like the, the surprise factor stuff, right? If you're playing Chap Tricks immediately, like upon the release of the structure deck. So that's something to think about as well. Um, like branded also I think is a is a very decent choice, especially if you've been playing it from before, because it seems like one of those decks that's insanely rewarding if you know how to pilot it well, because it literally has like a thousand plays you can do. Um so I think that's also a very, very nice choice. And um moving on from that, when you actually choose a deck, right? You have your deck chosen, and then when you're trying to build it, I think it's important like um we need to discuss the net decking thing, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's a bad thing. I'm not bashing anyone to, for doing it. And I think uh, gathering resources online is is a very important thing that you can do because it's there, right? It would be kind of like ignorant from you to not, to not use resources that are given to you. However, I think when you're choosing a build that you're trying to, that you're trying to run, there's more going into it than just taking a deck list from from the internet without any reasons like behind the, the choices and the ratios and the, the tech cards and all of that. And I think it's very important to to sort of like to understand that. So what's your thoughts on like making a deck list your own and actually understanding your own personal meta? Uh, I think it's I mean, it's always a good thing to try and improve deck lists you find online because the meta game usually never stays the same yet. Like you will never find or almost never. Like one one counter example would be the last format where like tier limits was at some point just kind of solved and it was right. like by far the best deck and mm -hmm. everyone was playing tier limits. So everyone was playing like the streamlined standard, you know, 40 to 43 cards. There was mm -hmm. barely any differences and it was completely fine to, to overall in your like practice and preparation for tournaments mm -hmm. to just focus on the technical play because that was far more important in last format mm -hmm. than the deck building portion. Like sure. I would say that yeah. anyone... Who like you could just copy the the list that won the last tournament as long as you were good with tier limit you could probably just win the next tournament right. True, that's and, very um, true. I'm very glad you brought that up. It does it yeah. does depend on the meta. It it is very meta dependent. Mm -hmm. There is metas where deck building is very important, mm -hmm. and I think the current meta might be one of those because I see a lot of dynamics where uh, the cash tier players are. It's very important as a cash tira player, or even as someone who's playing, a, who's aiming to counter cash tira. Mm -hmm. It's very important to to observe the meta developments that are happening and and what people are doing against these. Like for example, at the recent YCSs, I feel like a lot of people have been on the train on the train where you you play around Lava Golem and Nibiru by mm -hmm. making a, a Rise Heart that just requires four summons, right? Right. And they would back it up with cards like Forbidden Lands. That way you could play around Nibiru, um, Lava Golem, but also counter Book of Eclipse, which those were the three cards that almost everyone has been doing against Karsh Tira. That's like right. the number, the, the top three outs people have been doing against Karsh Tira were mm -hmm. those three, right? And, and there's a lot of things you can do now where you have to iterate on that, right? If I'm just copying a deck list from YCS Las Vegas and I the, every list had like Nibiru Book of Eclipse, I'm going to lose to exactly that. So I'm playing into what everyone else is already doing, right? I need to, sure. you need to be one step ahead in deck building. And that is something that you, you can iterate on, right? You can like replace Nibiru's and Lava Golems with like Kaiju's now or yes. Kurikara or mm -hmm. Lancia or other hand traps that that don't lose to like forbidden lands, for example, mm -hmm. and and also beat the Arise Heart when it's made in just three in just four summons, and that's something that you will never get that from from net decking basically because mm -hmm. by default if you're net decking you are behind right you're you're net decking from the last tournament mm -hmm. and the meta for the next tournament might be different and it might you, you might need to uh, change the stuff mm -hmm. which is why in a lot of formats you don't really see standard deck lists winning events there's always like a couple things that are like yeah yeah sort of out of the ordinary yeah previously yeah mm -hmm. 
Um, I think it's also like, it's important to understand that if you're going to locals, you don't need to necessarily take a deck list that literally just won the last YCS. Like, I think it's so important to emphasize that your personal meta and your tournament that you're going to does play a role. So uh, I think sometimes people are even a bit nervous or afraid to build their decks in a certain way, even though they know that you're there for a fact going to be facing a couple, I don't know, trap tricks, labyrinth, whatever. Just, you know, have your have your back row hate in, in the side deck and have more of it than you probably would have if you're going to another event. But it's, that's just an example. So I think it's like, I think people need to be less stressed about like building a deck for their personal meta, because if you're going to locals, you're trying to top your locals. You're not, you're not trying to win a OSCS. So I think it's I important. mean, that's always, it's always true that you need to look at what tournament am I going to mm -hmm. and what meta game am I expecting, right? If you're going to locals and you know, like, out of these 10 people at locals or however big your locals mm -hmm. is and you know, like, that 9 or 10 of them don't have Kashtira, they play some other stuff, you don't need to, you know, you don't need to exactly. prepare for Kashtira. And you also need to be aware of what are you, what are your goals when you're entering a tournament? Because for me personally, I... When I go to locals or even regionals, I mm -hmm. usually try to, to use these as testing grounds for bigger events. So mm -hmm. I'm usually not scared to bring something a little bit more wacky or something I'm mm -hmm. not sure about to a smaller tournament where I'm just trying to, first of all, I'm trying to have fun and I'm trying to uh, practice for, for something bigger. Whereas if I'm going to a YCS, I, I'm looking to be sure on my decisions, right? Of but course. if there's something I'm not sure about, when I'm going to a regionals or a locals, I'm more likely to just put it into the deck just to see how it performs rather than playing a standard list where I kind of know what I can expect, where I know what's what's going to perform how. And then, you know, I, mm -hmm. I don't really learn as much from from the tournament as if I had put a couple of experimental things into my into my deck. So what do you think are some of the things that you can actually do yourself when you are building a deck? And I'm talking specifically like, I think it's important when, for example, you build it like on Dueling Book or something before you actually build it IRL. Or even if you do it IRL and then you go and make it like do test hands. And I, I say DB because it's like you're not going to power shuffle like 20 times, you know, and doing <laughs> doing test hands in IRL because you're just going to hate everything. So just, just go on DB, you know, do test hands and just think to yourself about like things that you're trying to play through i think it's so important like sometimes people will say oh i'm testing with myself i'm doing test hands and all that but there's so much more that goes into it like you can literally try to prepare how to play around like five different things that they might throw at you or like how to go second in a board that's maybe already established when you know what the mm -hmm. top decks are like what are some of the things that you can do personally like with, with your with yourself when you're building a deck uh i mean you've, you've made some good points there i think when i I always prefer I always prefer uh, playing actual matches All to right. to play test, but I do think I mean it's a very time efficient way to mm -hmm. just look at a couple starting hands. I I usually do it when I'm trying to learn a deck, right? Mm -hmm. Just like the basics of it. I'm, I'm I'm just like I never start by just hopping into a game. I do just mm -hmm. like play down a couple of, of of test hands, but I do think it's it's totally fine as a as a way of testing um, because it's time efficient to just like draw mm -hmm. an opening hand. And then think about, okay, I have these five cards. What would I do with these going first? What would stop me? What board would I end up on? Is that board good enough against the current top decks? Mm -hmm. And then also with that same opening hand, you can just like look at the sixth card and be like, do I have a chance against a standard Kashtira board? Can mm -hmm. I beat Branded with this? Can I beat whatever else, mm -hmm. like Labyrinth? And then if the answer to most of those questions is very <laughs> often no, then uh, there has to be done something about the deck probably. True, true. And then when you're testing with other people, I think it's also important to, for example, if you have a testing group, that's also another thing. Like if you if you are able to like get together with people that you genuinely like, for example, at locals mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, create a testing group for yourself and then actually test with them. I think it's important to test actual matchups, especially if you're going to a tournament where you know you're going to be facing like three top strategies or something even if your friend for example is not exactly playing labyrinth i don't think it's that hard for them to actually build the deck and try to play it against you for you to test your deck and in return they can actually know that matchup for themselves as well because i think it's so important before you're going to a tournament not only to focus on your cards but to know the other decks as well and and that's a very good way of testing the other decks out to know what what to go up against like how to prepare <clears throat> yeah, it's it's very time intensive mm -hmm. to do this for for all the decks that are relevant. But True. for the most part, it really is as simple as uh, the best way to learn 
how to exploit a certain deck is to play it yourself for a bit. Yes. At least learn the basics, because then you will also see from the other perspective what the deck loses to a lot, right? You can yes. see like, okay, if my opponent does this or that here, that's very awkward for me, which is something that you will not really experiencing experience if you just play against the deck, right? If you just mm -hmm. play against the deck, you just do whatever you do and you see what works and what doesn't. But if you if you are sitting on the other side of the table, you will notice mm -hmm. a lot of the time that you will be like, oh, if they do this here, yeah, they then, will win then I, then I because <laughs> you know I can't I can't beat that or I can't out mm -hmm. that. This is a big problem for me because I need a very specific card and I don't have it right now. Mm -hmm. And um, that is something that you will learn a lot quicker when you also play the at least a couple matches from the deck's perspective against your deck. Mm -hmm. No, I agree 100%. And also doing that, you know what kind of cards they're going to be playing. Like, for example, I don't know. All right, for a fact, this strategy can go into Zeus. Okay, I need to think about that. I need to play around that. Or they can they can use this card or that tech card. Or maybe they have this weird, wacky build of, of, of this deck that uses five of, five of this archetypes cards or whatever. But you know that there is literally like a hundred options for you if you're playing that deck. Like for example, like Sprite uh, last format, you know, if you, if you maybe played it, even if it wasn't your go-to deck, you knew for a fact that there's like five different versions versions and you know what those versions do and what they go for so no matter what you face you know you know what you're going up against and i think it's also important to again utilize db like if you're going to be facing i don't know for for decks that you're expecting just build them actually have them ready on db just to know just to have a reference point to go look at the deck list and be like okay that's what i'm playing around that's what i need to think about because like every single time going on youtube and trying to look up a build and trying to look up a, a combo or a deck profile or something it's just going to be insanely time consuming so i think it's cool to just have this reference point for yourself as like your own type of research almost <clears throat> yeah i try to i try to maintain like a a couple of standard deck lists for a couple of archetypes mm -hmm. on on there like i'll just have a labyrinth deck build even if i not if i don't plan mm -hmm. on using it right now or mm -hmm. like i have a cash tira deck build and i will like adjust it as i see what other people are doing. Like yeah. if I see a lot of the people try Forbidden Lands, or if I think Forbidden Lands is gonna be standard, I'm gonna throw it in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I if I think Book of Eclipse is standard, I'll also put it in there. And like, mm -hmm. I, it's basically not, I'm, I'm not making the decisions for how that version looks. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm making those, I'm building it for what I think other people will do. Mm -hmm. Right? Not not, uh, it's not it's not necessarily what I think is the best version of the deck, but it's what I think yeah. is the deck to beat, basically, if we're talking exactly. about Kashira. Which is not always the, the same, of course, like only mm -hmm. because Forbidden Lands is kind of like a standard right now. It doesn't mean yeah. everyone is playing it, but it's like something to prepare for. And it's just I think uh, if you if you have a couple of of builds of those decks, you don't even need to perfect them uh, to, to pilot them perfectly. You can yeah. just like have them there just so you know what cards are there and how they work exactly. and i think that that already helps in in terms of preparing optimally for an event you definitely need to know what the other decks are up to for sure i think another thing that's very important is there's two things right <clears throat> one of them is it's always so funny to go up against someone they they pick up their cards and they play a card that, for example, like I'm going to give a, a, a an example, like Brand of Fusion. They activate it and then they think for like five minutes what to send. And immediately you go, OK, <laughs> all right, <laughs> I know what I'm dealing with right now. So it's no. important to not do that. Like before you go, to, like literally like step through the door of the regional, you need to know what your cards do, what your interactions are, what you want to be doing. Because if you're going to be wasting time thinking about your combos, number one, you're going into time. Number two, your opponent is for sure going to know that you're not exactly 100% certain what you're doing so they might adjust their plays and it's also like you're literally digging yourself a hole it's like why do it if you know what kind of deck you're going to be taking somewhere be prepared with it like know what your cards do and also know like the stupid little tiny interactions or the things like the illegal plays like there's some decks where easily you can make a mistake or you're locked into something or whatever like you don't want to be cheating your opponents like know what your cards do <clears throat> There's a lot that goes into that type of stuff because it also, it can also just be an actual disadvantage for you in some scenarios if you're mm -hmm. not well prepared. Like one one perfect example of this is preparing your uh, hand trap choke points for for certain matchups. Right. Where like, uh, in testing or in like maybe even locals, it's totally okay to have an ash in your hand and not know where to use it against a certain deck yet. 
Yeah. But in in a big tournament or in any tournament that's important to you, you should know where to use your hand traps uh, immediately mm -hmm. without having to to think a couple times. Like for example, um, against Kashtira, if you if you reach the decision that you always want to ash the uh, the Theosis, for example, mm -hmm. you should never be like uh, a they activate the field spell and you go like think. Right? Yeah. And you, you think for like 30 seconds yes. and then you say okay and then you they know basically what you have yes. so they might go for like i don't know a unicorn at birth mm -hmm. instead right because they read that you have an ash blossom so mm -hmm. if you know you should try and find out which hand traps you want to use on on what card in in which matchup mm -hmm. and then just like don't waste any time if they activate the field spell you have an ash but you already know that you're not going to ash it then just say okay and they can't you know yeah read it of course you can also do it like one step further if you don't have an ash you can like you know maybe bluff it or something to force them into a worse mm -hmm. play but that's like a couple levels ahead it's like big but brain for plays, like the yes. basic understanding <laughs> like if you have a hand trap you never want to telegraph that hand trap mm -hmm. so be you, you need to be uh, aware of when you want to use it Sure, that's very, very important. And also, um, since you mentioned hand traps, what about the side deck? Like, you will see people go into their side deck and literally think and sweat and yeah. look around and just, just yeah. waste a lot of time. And I'm, I'm seeing all of this, like, I'm most definitely not making fun. It's like, I've been in those situations when I was underprepared myself, but it's like, you don't need to do this to yourself. If you know beforehand what your sighting patterns are going to be, just, just make use of it. Like, and sometimes people will build their side decks in a way where it's like five, pl five play sets or something. And, it doesn't really make sense because they don't have as many cards to take out from their main deck as as many as they want to put in. So, like, what's your thoughts on that entire thing? I, I see that a lot. It's mm -hmm. like they they will have like they they will have a very popular matchup where like a, a good example of this is Fluon Reese, like last mm -hmm. format where every single deck needed like had played like seven bestials or more in the main deck and then mm -hmm. they had to side those out against flunder but they didn't even have that many cards against flunder in their yeah. side deck yeah or they they had that many cards against flunder in the side deck but they were only good going second so when they went first they had to keep like bestials in their mm -hmm. deck or something mm -hmm. because they they decided like i don't know lightning storm evenly matched and that that, yeah. that was their side deck against flunder but then like you go first what do you want in your deck like exactly. seven bestials or lightning storm and evenly matched like none of that mm -hmm. so that is an, an issue that like already starts in deck building, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, when you're sitting down at the table, it's already too late if you've made that decision, right? If, you, if mm -hmm. you've built your side deck that way, you can think about it as much as you want during side decking. You're not going to find a good solution. So that's something you need to, to look at during deck building is like, you know, which matchups do I want to respect in side decking? Because mm -hmm. I'll tell you one thing right off the bat, you can't respect every single deck, especially in a diverse format. Like <clears throat> You have to make a cutoff at some point. Yeah. You're like, okay, this deck, maybe I'll face it, but it's like, first of all, not even that good. And also, uh, it's probably not worth putting cards in my side deck for a matchup that I maybe face once in mm -hmm. like a 12-round event or something. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to make a cutoff. Like right now, for example, like Cash Tira, definitely worth side decking for. True. Branded, definitely mm -hmm. worth side decking for. Labyrinth, most likely worth side decking for. Mm -hmm. And then like maybe you respect Sprite a little bit as well. And at that point, it's it's already starting to get a little bit thin, right? There's not mm -hmm. that much else. Um, whereas like, you know, you look at like Trap Tricks, you're like, okay, for Trap Tricks, I should probably have the same cards that also work against Labyrinth, for example. Yes. Like I'm not going to try and like, you know, that's where multi-purpose cards should come in and cover those types of matchups that are not as common. Um, I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe I'm forgetting something right now. But just just as an example, I don't think you, like, you have to like yeah. make a make a list of decks that you want to respect in side decking, and then see if it's possible with how many cards you want to take in and out. Mm -hmm. And then for all of those popular decks, you should probably know what to side in and out immediately. Like I will usually at a at a YCS or regional where I'm like well prepared, I will usually take like. 10 seconds to side deck like that's it <laughs> that's very scary part. i imagine people sitting sitting down against you and then you go like Shh, and you just side like in, in a couple seconds you're ready you look at them like oh you're still siding i'm ready no it's like i'm, I'm usually <laughs> done before they've like sided oh out a card like before they've decided <laughs> on the first thing or something like it's 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 
if you know what you're doing during mm -hmm. side decking, I mean, sometimes if there's a matchup where it's not super common or they've, they've yeah. played a couple of cards that are not usual for their ma for their deck, like if you've seen a couple of cards that maybe change the way you look at the matchup, but for the most part, if it's just a standard, like tier limit mirror last format, YCS Leon, I'm playing mm -hmm. a tier limit mirror, I'll be done with side decking in 10 seconds. Cause I've, of course I've prepared this before the event. I've put certain cards in my side deck for the mirror match and I know what I'm gonna take out for them. So like, I'll, I'll take, I'll, I'll take a couple seconds, that's it. Mm -hmm. No, and that's very, very important, I think. And people don't really, they underestimate it sometimes, like the side decking overall, and they'll just throw things in and then just hope for the best, <laughs> basically. Um, yeah. Also, another thing that I think needs to be stressed, uh, stressed upon, or whatever the wording is, is basically rules. Like, but I'm, I'm not talking about like complex stuff, but just the, yeah. just to have the mere understanding of how PCST works, or PSS, PSCT, PSCT. It's what, it's, yeah. it's what I would say. <laughs> so how the problem solving card text works or like the damage step, like what can you, what you can activate or not, or like, uh, for example, right now, Book of Moon, Book of Eclipse are seeing play and you will still hear people like calling a judge and asking, what do, what does a monster remember? You know, it will just flip face up. Can I do this? Can I do that? And it's like, um, you can prepare for those things. Like there's literally a ton of resources online. And if you know all of this, number one, you're not going to get cheated. And number two, like you, you can actually like also, it's a bit, intimidating i think to the opponent like if you 100 know everything and it's like yes you can do that you can do that or whatever like just take a couple yeah. minutes literally and just just get ready when it comes to those things because it's always gonna I mean, be handy yeah being at, at all times being aware of what's possible and what's not possible to you and to your opponent is is very valuable right because it's it plays into the option like if you if you don't know that they can do a certain thing with a face down card but then they end up doing it and you didn't prepare for it or you didn't play around it then yes like, you know that that ends up costing you the, the game. Like for example, mm -hmm. I know it's an old example, but I'm a boomer, but like the fact that you can like contact fuse with like face down gladiator beasts, for example. If mm -hmm. that's something you don't know, you might throw a book of moon at a best Yari and lose the match because of it. Like sure. it's, it's a very simple example, but like you need mm -hmm. to be aware of, of these types of things. And uh, I know it's a lot, it's very complex, but honestly the best way to learn that stuff is to like just play as much as possible. The yeah. things will come up and then you remember it for the next time. That's one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Of course, the other way, the more boring way is to just learn the, the rule document. Uh, true. But I'm going to be <laughs> honest, I haven't done that either. It's just like I've, I've been playing the game for so long that I yeah. know most of the things anyways. Mm -hmm. um, every once in a while, something will still happen where I'm like not sure and then I have to remember it. But it's, yeah, it's it, it just comes naturally by playing, I think. Of course, and you can always like look back and just you know look at a deck like I remember for example Sky Striker was a deck that te that taught me a lot. Like Sky Striker had so many interesting interactions, like the damage step, what you can do, what you can't, and all of that. Like sometimes like just the decks that you play or the decks that you face a lot are going to teach you a whole bunch. So you don't need to yeah like he said you don't need to go like just geek out and study everything. Um, yeah. But yeah like it's it's very useful to remember those things. So now that we have covered a lot of like the prep basically what are some of the most important things you maybe would like to talk about when it comes to tournament mentality like when you are actually there okay i know i'm prepared like just going round to round uh i i just try to use or try to go one round at a time usually is mm -hmm. is my mentality i'm like i i think one of the biggest things which is also one of the hardest things is not getting caught up in in losses especially when they happen early Mm -hmm. is probably the most important thing because people get really, really mad when they lose early or when they lose because of a top deck or when they lose because they get unlucky. For mm -hmm. some people, it's worse when they lose because they misplay. For some others, it's worse when they lose because of bad luck and they couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Both of those things happen, but you don't gain anything from, you know, throwing away your next match because of it as well because you, like, yeah. be start become less focused. Um, it's really about just like taking one one match at a time and uh and just trying to do as well as you can and i i also can't always do that like I'll, one example i think at ycs leon i i went through day one x2 so i thought mm -hmm. i had to win all three rounds on day two to make it into top 64. Mm -hmm. and then i lost i believe round 11. Mm -hmm. So I was X3 after round 11. And like my my mental just dropped after that. I thought it was yeah. over. I, th I thought it was done. 
I was like, it doesn't even matter anymore. I'll, I guess I'll just play the last round, mm -hmm. and then and then you know, so be it. And then I won the last round, and I made top sixty four as like sixty second place or something. But my mind mm -hmm. was already gone. Like I was yeah. already thinking about like, can I still sign up for the Edison side event or whatever? So I was like completely surprised by the fact that I got sixty top sixty four. And throughout all of top sixty four, I don't think I played as well as I did throughout the 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 first half of the tournament or whatever. I played like. I don't think I played super well in top 64 and top mm -hmm. 32. I end up winning top 64 and 32, so yeah. I lost in top 16. But like my, I noticed a bunch of misplays after I just like turned off my mental after round uh, 11. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. It's like it's 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 tough to to maintain a good mental state throughout a long tournament. Uh, is is sure. what I'm trying to say by that. Even even I don't uh, don't always manage to do it. Like I'll I'll have tournaments where it, where it works very well, and I'm very happy with how I play. But then sometimes I have a I have events or I have I have certain rounds where I'm just like I don't know why I played the way I just did and I, sometimes I get punished for it sometimes I don't because <laughs> the game sometimes you know is uh, I, I, st I still get lucky even though I misplay but it's um it's very tough and even after 20 years or something of 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 playing the game it still happens mm -hmm. I mean, for sure, we're only people, like, at the end of the day, like, you get nervous, of course. Yeah. But how does the mentality, like, change maybe when you actually reach top cut? If it's not as unexpected as maybe your top cut at OSCS yeah. Leon was, but, like, how does it change when you're going to, like, I don't know, close to the finals or something? Like, I want to hear all about that. I try to not think about it as much as possible. I try mm -hmm. to act like, basically, <laughs> I don't care. Okay. I don't know. I try, I, I, because that helps me taking it seriously, I think. Because if uh -huh. I if I ever start thinking about how important this is to me right now, mm -hmm. I will I will start like you know I'll I'll start being more nervous than before. I'll be like, uh, I I'll I'll try to focus as much as I can on just this next match. I'll don't mm -hmm. I, I'll I'll not think about like oh this is top sixty four. If I win, it's top thirty two, and then I only mm -hmm. need to win five more. It's like I'll I'll just be like okay sit down next match see see how well you can do just focus on that and then whatever comes after is is after that and um, I don't even know if that's the best mentality for top cut you know it's it's hard to it's hard to tell maybe it's uh, maybe there's something else you can do even better maybe there's other people out there I'm sure there's also something that works for other people in different ways uh, mm -hmm. I think that's something that is very individual. Um, but I, I will say that even even after the, the amount of time that I've been playing, I still feel a lot of pressure and I still mm -hmm. get very nervous. I think the only thing that changes is that I start learning how to deal with being nervous or how to right. play under pressure. Um, so most of the time I'll be fine. I mean, it's, I think it's very cool that we just talked about that. So, you know, people can be like, yes, even Joshua Schmidt gets nervous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, <laughs> um, another thing I wanted to mention when you're actually at the event, I think it's important to sometimes out here, and we literally talked about that at Locals the other day, like um, how sometimes when a person is playing very slowly, even if it's not intentional or if it is, sometimes people will get nervous to say something and i think it's important not only when it comes to your opponent being slow but overall like the entire communication like just being polite and just not being afraid to say all right so can we maybe speed things up a bit like i don't exactly want to go into time i think it's like sometimes you just face someone that just is straight up rude or something and i think it's also a thing that can really ruin your tournament experience especially if you then maybe lose in time or something so um how do you go about like just literally dealing with the opponent if they're a bit unpleasant maybe <laughs> i mean it is something that is like more on the hard side for me as well because i am usually more of an introverted type of person whereas mm -hmm. like i think it's easier if you're extroverted to just like tell them you know speed up yeah <laughs> i will usually i mean i i'm usually always trying to be very polite so i only rarely have it that opponents will not be polite back i feel mm -hmm. like if <laughs> the easiest thing is if you're polite to your opponent they'll most likely be polite back um and if at any point if at any point you have a such a rude opponent i would just i would in that scenario uh you'd have to be like screw it i'm just gonna call a judge if it becomes too mm -hmm. bad like it always sucks to face a rude player like it never feels good mm -hmm. but um I do think the only consequence that is like reasonable is to just like 
they, they I, I think if you're being rude to your opponent there should be some consequence for them so mm -hmm. like you 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 calling a judge on them if they are being s slow and rude mm -hmm. is is not a bad is not a bad thing and then when your opponent is very polite but still playing slow i'll usually remind them one or two times and mm -hmm. when they still do it after that then i mean you have not you have no other choice than yeah. calling a judge sure i will never i will never uh, try or i'll always try to not be rude back mm -hmm. um like if they are polite um, I'll be polite and then at some point I'll, I'll be like, hey, sorry, I need to call a judge. I, I'm not trying to be mm -hmm. rude at them because they don't, they might not do it on purpose or something. And uh, even if my opponent is rude, I'll just be like, I'm, I'm going to call a judge. I'm not I'm not going to try and like be rude back to them because it's yeah. just going to like, you know, you're going to make each yeah. other just more mad. So yeah, like, it just results in a mess, I think. Yeah. Um, also, another thing I think is really important, um, we've had the no time rules for quite some time now. And mm -hmm. I still think sometimes people will, will, it will happen to them, they go into time, they don't really think about the time as much as they maybe should. Uh, and I think it's a, another important thing, like if you know time is literally running out, like maybe send the opponent first or try to not do as much in main phase two, just go to battle, deal some damage and try to combo in, sorry, main phase one and then try to combo in main phase two. And um, I think that's very, very important to literally like adjust your plays as time is running out. And then sometimes people will like go into time and then they'll get mad. And it's like you did it to yourself. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's another part of like the mentality at an event to think about like time and all of that. Yeah, I mean, it's very important that you don't, you know, like slow play or anything. Of course. Uh, but yes. it is also at the same time important to be aware of how much time you have left. Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, it it can it can change your plays, right? It can change your plays in certain ways because you mm -hmm. you might not want to activate that sprite starter if you if there's only a minute left, right? You might want to search that yes. sprite smashers instead. That's what I'm saying. You know, yeah. that's not that's not against the rules. It's mm -hmm. like to 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 make decisions like that, and for just to be able to make decisions like that, it's very important to uh, yeah. to be aware of how much time is left, which of course is. A lot harder the, yeah. depending on you know what tournament you're you're attending. Sometimes you know locals that they, they might not have a clock, or even regionals might not have a clock. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you know there's not that much you can do other than you know uh, either I don't know even I don't even know if you can put a a clock on the table. I think if it's I'm I mean if sure you're if using that's... Neuron, you probably can just run the timer on there, right? Oh, so is there a timer on Neuron? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it's probably that's yeah. probably allowed then. Yeah, yeah. Then, I mean, if you have if you notice that you have an issue with that and it happens to you a lot, mm -hmm. then you can probably try using that. Like even if there's mm -hmm. no accessible clock at your locals, you're probably allowed to use a timer like that to just keep yeah. track of it and maybe learn how to deal with it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important like uh, during testing still like to just play play with a mm -hmm. timer. Uh, I always like to do it like because you just train your brain to to think about the time like at all times even though it gets a bit intensive when you're literally testing and then you're looking at the time but still you know you're prepared when you actually go to an event. Um, yeah, I, I don't but... do that when I try to learn a deck or when I try mm -hmm. to learn a specific matchup. I mm -hmm. don't try to think of it as time pressure because then in that sense I will usually or my testing partner and i will usually take more time on purpose because mm -hmm. we're trying to figure out you know the best lines possible and how to approach the matchup so it's not comparable to uh, mm -hmm. a tournament game because we are on purpose like maybe even talking yeah. about our place with someone else or, or or even like allowing take backs because uh, mm -hmm. we we want to see how that would have played out if we would have done it differently um so in that sense, there's different ways on how to test. But if it's if it's something you notice you have a problem with in a tournament, then I think it's definitely good mm -hmm. to sit down and uh, and basically emulate that by playing even testing games with with the mm -hmm. timer. Sure, I'm very glad you mentioned this because I would actually like to like you to elaborate a bit on that before we wrap this up. I think this this is going to be mm -hmm. our last topic. Basically, how does the how does it work for you? You know, when you're choosing a deck, going into testing, and then first you're playing out the the hands yourself, maybe, or going going through it with your testing partner, t having take backs, and then actually playing real games. Like, how does it progress for you, basically? Uh, it's it's a very long process. It depends mm -hmm. uh, how much time I also have for a tournament, because sometimes I'll have tournaments where there's a lot happening before before I go to that tournament, so mm -hmm. I don't have as much time to prepare. Sometimes I can start really early because I have a lot of time to prepare. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it sometimes changes on that, but for the most part, I really like to 
the the first step I do is to learn the basics of all the other all the decks in the format or like all the decks I think are relevant. Like I'll look mm -hmm. at I look at all the decks that I I consider relevant for the format and I'll learn the basics and then mm -hmm. I'll see if I like one of them enough to 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 focus on it, right? Mm -hmm. Um and then I'll follow that up usually with a lot of theory. Either like just to try and find out which of these decks performs the best because I'm I'm going to be honest even the best playtesting does not replace solid the ability to do solid theory in Yu-Gi-Oh is is very very valuable mm -hmm. because you cannot possibly play enough testing games mm -hmm. to to actually like you know replace True. good theory like you, the amount of games you'd have to play to to figure out whether a certain like one of or whatever is good mm -hmm. in your deck is 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 uh, crazy. You'd have to play like I don't know a hundred games against each deck in order to find out. You know, like be mm -hmm. because only because you you play a card and then you draw it one time and it's dead does not mean it's a bad card in your deck, right? Like you you'd mm -hmm. have to play so much more to find that out on how how often the card wins you the game, how often the card is dead in your hand or whatever. Um, so I I think theory is is very very important. Mm -hmm. And so I, I like to do a lot of that and, and come up with a couple of ideas of, of certain decks or how you could adjust certain decks to, to work better in the, in the current metagame. Because I do not really like, except for like in tier limit format, I usually don't like bringing um, standard deck lists. Like mm -hmm. you very, very rarely find me bringing a, a very standard deck list to a tournament because I always feel like... I it's better to be a step ahead than mm -hmm. just doing what everyone is expecting. And uh, so I'll I'll try to come up with something and then I'll just like, you know, I'll, I'll then I'll put that into practice. I'll mm -hmm. be like, okay, I've I've theoried up something that I think is good enough to to bring to this tournament. And then I will I'll, I'll ask people around who's up for testing and then I will, you know, have them play um the the top decks of the format and see mm -hmm. if what I thought would work if it actually does work. Um, mm -hmm. And if it does, then great. We can like iterate on that. We can like continue with testing with that. If it doesn't, then you have to go back to the drawing board. You know, very often you'll have an idea mm -hmm. that doesn't quite work out, even though it sounded fine in theory. Maybe it has some flaws that you will then discover in in testing. Um, and then at, from this point on, it's just an iterative process, honestly, mm -hmm. of like um, having an idea, trying it out, and then seeing if it works. And if at any point you can't find something, like for example, in Ishizu tier, I did this too. In Ishizu yeah. tier format, I did the same thing. I tried out different stuff mm -hmm. to try and counter Ishizu tier. It ended up not working, so I had to you default played Ishizu tier, to right? like uh, <laughs> Ishizu tier. So what yes. I would, what I ended up doing throughout most of last format was usually I would give myself a time frame until when I needed to find something else. Right? Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm gonna try and find something to exploit. Ishizu tier, and mm -hmm. if I, if it doesn't work until like one week before the YCS, mm -hmm. I will just spend the last week. I will just give up on anything <laughs> like creative and just practice tier mirrors for an for an entire week, which is usually enough for me to yeah. to 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 learn the ins and outs of a deck. Um, that is a time frame that might be different for some other people, right? but that is basically for me. That is like a method how I can. Try to experiment, try to find something, but it's kind of mm -hmm. like that fail safe of like, if I don't find anything, I'll set myself this this one week time where I can just learn Ishizu tier in in as an example for last format and be like, if nothing else works, I'll just go in with Ishizu tier and try to be as as good as possible with it. Mm -hmm. And like for this format, an example could be, I'm gonna try and find a solution. I kind of like Cash Tira, but I feel like there could be something else. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna say up until one week before YCS London, I'm gonna test everything else. And if nothing works, I have one week to to perfect my play and deck build with uh, with Cash Tira, for example. Mm -hmm. I love this. I'm really, really glad I asked this question. I learned a lot from from listening to you explain all of this. And overall, I think this was a great way to to end the video. I I had a lot of fun talking to you. I mean, I enjoy talking about the game and talking with someone yeah, with your like reputation and all of that. Um, it was really great to host you, and you are always welcome back if you would ever like to return for another discussion. And overall, you guys, if you like this, like please let us know. Um, I enjoy making these types of videos with guests, so let me know which kinds of guests you would like to see moving forward and let us know what you thought today of this video i'll make sure to put all of josh's socials in the description box below and of course you guys make sure to like the video sub check out all the social media and i'll see you guys in the next one
拜。